Hello, my name is John Riley, Business Development Leader here at CSI, and we are fortunate enough to have Eric Gore with us, going to be presenting on pump cavitation. Thank you for joining us. Um, 30,000 foot view, just real quick, of what CSI is and, and what we do. We build, uh, we, we design, fabricate, and engineer skidded equipment, as you see behind us, as well as distribute all the process components associated with it. Um, just for, for, for the topic of our discussion today, Eric's going to be covering what cavitation is, uh, the causes and issues associated with it, as well as prevention for pump cavitation. And we're going to address all your questions at the end, so please go ahead and put those in the chat as, as we process. Eric, I'm going to let you take it over. Yeah, thank you, John. Welcome. I'm going to talk a little bit about pump cavitation and what is cavitation. Well, one definition of it is it's the creation and later collapse of bubbles in a fluid. So that, that's the point where people usually ask questions, do these bubbles just magically appear? Well, they don't, and there's some science behind where they come from. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so I'll probably start here. Uh, think of when you were a child, you might have learned that uh, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's part of the story. Really, the other part of that story is water boils at 212 degrees in an open container at sea level. Take that same container, go to Denver, Colorado. You're now 5,000 feet higher in the air. That water really is going to boil more around 212, or sorry, 203 degrees. So what's different? So we know the higher you are, the lower the temperature water boils, the, the difference is pressure. So at sea level, you have all the pressure of the atmosphere above you pushing down on that fluid, which helps make it boil at 212 degrees. When you're in Denver, you have much less atmosphere, 5,000 feet less, pushing on that fluid, makes it boil at lower temperature. So knowing that pressure affects what temperature water boils, it stands to reason if you got high enough in the air, uh, water could boil at, say, the temperature in this room. I have an example for that. In my hand, I have a, a pretty simple syringe. And this syringe is one that's generally used to uh, maybe give medication to a small child. And in it, I have water. And that water is uh, room temperature, so it's about 72 degrees, I would say, in here. And I'm going to cover the end of this. And if you see in here, no bubbles. When I pull this plunger back, I'll be lowering the pressure of that water and you'll see air bubbles appear. Then I will let off of the plunger and you'll see those bubbles disappear. So there's the creation of bubbles and the collapse of those bubbles. And I can do that a couple times, let you see it. So how does that translate to a process system? Let's take that concept and go over here. We have a uh, demonstration skid that we have built to show some of these concepts. So I'll give you a little tour of it. Here we have a tank of water. It's uh, room temperature. That water then is traveling through a pipe, past this sight glass, through this alpha valve centripetal pump, and on through some piping system where it returns back to this tank. So right now, John, about how fast are we running? You're running about 15 hertz, about 30 or 25%. Okay, how many GPM? About 50 GPM right okay. now. So we're flowing at about 50 GPM or gallons per minute through this line. And if you get down here and look, you can see in this sight glass, no bubbles. It's actually um, doing a really nice job of traveling through here, no bubbles. So we're going to ask John to turn the pump up and we're going to see what happens. You want to go to like 50%, 30 hertz? Let's, let's start at 50%. So about how many gallons a minute are we running? You're about 120, 125. Okay, so 120 gallons per minute. And you can see now in this sight glass, we're getting bubbles. Now, where did those bubbles come from? It's similar to that tube, we've got lower pressure. And you can even see on this pressure gauge, we're actually below zero on pressure. So what's happening is as this pump's trying to move liquid, liquid can't get into that pump fast enough so the pressure drops, and now we're starting to get bubbles, which is the cavitation. So now, John, go ahead and turn the turn it up to 100%, and let's see what happens. So about how many gallons per minute? You're just over 150 gallons per minute. Okay, so at 150 gallons per minute through this line, you can see a significant amount of bubbles are created. So you also might notice how loud this system is. Can you hear that running? Sounds like gravel going through the pump. So a key sign of cavitation. Also notice 
our pressure on our inlet gauge is very low and also very erratic. Now on the outlet side of this pump, you'll also notice this pump or this gauge here, very erratic, uh, jumping around. You can tell that the pump's not performing very well. Hey, Eric, do you mind if I turn it down? I, I'm not yeah, to... please, please turn it down so we can talk a little better. So I'm actually glad John pointed that out. It's kind of a rule of thumb of mine that if you are in a process plant and a pump is running and it's hard to have a conversation over that running pump because of its volume, it's a good chance the pump's struggling and having some problems due to cavitation. A, a pump running well within its duty condition that's plumbed in correctly and operating optimally, you should be able to have a pretty normal volume conversation over um, w without yelling. So what is it? What does it really matter if a pump cavitates? So why do you care if a pump cavitates? There's a couple of problems in a pump that's cavitating. One is those bubbles go into the pump at the point where they transfer to pressure. Now they collapse and that collapse is really violent. It actually happens sometimes faster than the speed of sound. And it's hard on the, the internal pieces of the pump. It's not uncommon you could take a pump like this apart that's been being cavitated and find that the impeller and the componentry look like they've been blasted with uh, sand, maybe even pieces missing out of the material. That's a result of cavitation that shortens the life of the pump. Additionally, that violent uh, reaction inside the pump is very hard on the motor that's driving it, so it'll shorten the bearing life in the motor. And then the pump seals. Pump seals are a rather expensive part of a pump, and if a pump's in cavitation, it's causing damage to those seals that greatly shorten the uh, the life of those seals. What are some of those causes that, that cause a pump to cavitate? So what causes a pump to cavitate? Well, if I had to pick the most common thing that causes a pump to cavitate is it's the, uh, the piping leading into the pump is either too small or uh, is uh, too long, too far away from the source. And how do you know if it's too small or if it's too far away? You know, that. It's a good question. A lot of times that's, that's a little bit of math, which, which we can help with. A lot of good pump suppliers can. Um, we want to calculate how much liquid is going to freely flow to the pump. In an ideal situation, liquid can freely flow to the pump at the rate at which you want to send it on. So if you want to pump at 100 gallons a minute, you need to make sure that your piping system from the source to the pump is capable of free flowing that amount. One thing that I, I kind of think of in my head is Pretend for a moment you unclamped the pump and just took it out, how much liquid would freely run out onto the ground. As long as that's similar to the amount you're wanting to pump, the pump probably won't cavitate. Aside from that, is there any other things like if, if you have a strainer in line or anything? Yeah, there, there are other equipment. Strainer's a good example. So if you have a strainer, which is a very common thing people will put in front of a pump to help protect it. Strainer could plug, maybe the orifices in it are rather small, can be starving that pump causing cavitation. Uh, this valve is a real good example. In this case, it's a butterfly valve and it's open, so it's not restricting flow, but um, maybe it got left in a, in a semi-closed state. Possibly it's a different style of valve that's causing some form of pressure drop. And I can give an example that, run, John, run us back to about 30 Hertz. So we should go back to cavitating based on what we saw earlier at this flow rate, but I'll, I'll exaggerate it some by closing this. So you can see the air bubbles now, but watch as I start to close this valve. Now I'm starving that pump, causing further cavitation. So that's kind of an example of something in the piping system that is, uh, that is causing it. Uh, in addition to that, it can be uh, sometimes tank some details around the tank. Uh, we'll frequently will hear from folks that uh, beginning of my batch or at certain times, pumps work just fine. Later on, pumps don't work so well. When you really dig into the details, they'll find that when a tank's full, there's enough, there's enough weight pushing to cause pressure to make the pump work well. And then when they get down to the lower parts of the tank, there's not that pressure pushing on the, on the pump and they'll have cavitation problems. So in some instances, if you're able to adjust what your minimum volume in a tank is, you can eliminate pump cavitation. And then uh, another possibility, if you can't change your piping, 
raise the tank higher in the air and add leg extensions to it has been one way that people have, uh, have fixed pump cavitation problems. Eric, thank you for the presentation and thank you all for joining us. We greatly appreciate it. Please, we have a few more minutes. Go ahead and leave any questions you have in the, in the chat and we'll address them now. Thank you. All right, before we get to your questions, just want to let everybody know that we appreciate you joining us and we're also going to take a look at as many questions as we can in the time period that we have. Um, so without further ado, we'll get to the first question. It looks like we, the first one is when CIP in a tank, we try to keep it empty and the pump is noisy. Is there, uh, should we keep level in the tank is what they're asking. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So from a cleaning perspective, it's, it's generally best to keep the tank empty. Yeah. Meaning you want that liquid coming down the sidewalls sweeping out to the outlet and down the drain. Now the consequence of doing that is that you're also getting air down and into the pump. Now that is different than cavitation. Cavitation is where that liquid is losing all the pressure, holding it into a liquid form, and it gasses off into a bubble. That bubble then collapses. Well, this is different. This is a slug of air that goes just passes through the pump. Um, now there are times people will let a little level build in a tank, maybe to clean an agitator or something, but cleaning generally you want, want it empty. Now, even though it is different, just air going through the pump, it, it can cause some trouble with the pump, maybe air locking, some performance issues. So it's, it is different, but if you're having problems with it, maybe reach out to us. We, we can help you select some pumps that are really designed to deal with entrained air. We're good for CIP return. Gotcha. So. Makes sense. Now, see, we have some other questions. What's that? I see there's yep. some other. Yep, I'm going to go ahead and get this one. That's a good question, Eric, because honestly, whenever we've talked about centrifugal pumps or in cavitation, it's usually all about centrifugals. But the question is, are centrifugal pumps the only pumps susceptible to cavitation, or can other types, PDs in particular? Fair question. So a lot, a lot of this demonstration, we, we really did focus on centrifugal pumps because that's, that's what we have in this, uh, in this demonstration. Also, uh, when, when uh, individuals reach out to us with cavitation problems or just pumping problems in general, uh, they recognize cavitation in the central, or they recognize a problem, I should say, because yeah. it's very noisy and very obvious. They're spinning fast, turning fast, and it reveals itself as this sound of gravel or marbles going through the pump. But pretty well every pump can cavitate. It's, if you're trying to pump faster than liquid gets into the pump, that's where you'd experience cavitation. Gotcha. Um, for instance, on like a SRU, alpha valve SRU rotary low pump, they can be cavitated. It just sounds different. They're moving much slower. Uh, it can be hard on the internal components, can shorten the life of that pump, can degrade performance. It just isn't as obvious, but yes, all pumps can cavitate. Come. All right, Eric, so I see another question up. Um, question, does viscosity of a product play a role in PD pump cavitation? PD pump cavitation. Or, or does viscosity play a role in any pump cavitation? It, it plays a role in all, all cavitation. So it, it, during the presentation, we talked a little bit about how we can calculate how much liquid would just free flow out of the tank yep. to the pump. One of the uh, variables in that calculation is viscosity. Yeah. So anything thicker than water, then it starts making it harder for that liquid to get into the pump. So maybe a thicker fluid would require a bigger line size or needs to be closer to the pump to uh, eliminate cavitation. So if you looked at an application with water versus something that was say 300 centipoise, very likely the, the pipe diameter may need to be bigger, maybe the pump needs to be closer to the source to uh, prevent cavitation. So okay. it's a big part of it. Last question that I can see at least on that, that we have up and that we have time for. If a pump is cavitating, are there things I can do to change the pump to stop the cavitation after the pump? After the pump. I know we've talked a lot about, about before. Yeah, if you'll notice in our presentation, we talked a lot about from the tank or the source to the pump. That's almost always where problems occur. Um, the short answer, if, if after the pump, there's nothing you can do after the pump to eliminate cavitation other than slow the pump down or pump, try to pump slower. Cavitation is always in front of the pump problem. Okay. Sounds good. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, 
Please feel free to join us uh, for our next presentation at 11.15 tomorrow for common process issues. If you have any questions in regards to pump cavitation or anything else coming up, feel free to reach out to Eric and I um, on the 1-800 number at CSI. Thank you.